Hey, I'm Stefan Spencer, host of Marketing Speak, and today we have Jared Krause with us. And Jared is an expert on the buying and selling of online businesses, and particularly the buying of them. Uh, he's got a great story. He used to be a plumber working 60 hours a week plus <laughs> and hated yeah, it. Plus. <laughs> yeah, and then... He's now in where he is today. He owns multiple online businesses himself. He has many clients that earn thousands to tens of thousands of dollars per month from their business that they bought working with Jared. His Buying Online Businesses podcast is rated in the top five best passive income podcasts online. Jared, it's so great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Stefan. I really appreciate our talks and I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah, so we, we just uh, uh, did some interviews for uh, your show and for your virtual summit. So that was a lot of fun. And uh, thank you for having me as, uh, ha as a guest expert. Um, I'm, I'm curious, like, where do you see this heading? Because uh, in terms of the, 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 you know, I think the economy is uh, kind of in trouble, We're probably heading towards a recession and so forth. And people are getting more um, careful about their investments. They're going to invest in something they understand versus don't understand if they're not really a, uh, you know, that, that savvy with online businesses. Or, or, does that mean that kind of the market's going to dry up for the buying and selling of online businesses? Or do you think that this is the future, like this is the new real estate and we're just going to see this ramp up massively? W what's your take on all that? That's a great question. And to be honest, I do this see I do see this as the new real estate. Uh, and I, I relate a lot of what buying a website is to buying uh, real estate. Now, what most people don't realize is that when you're buying property, you're buying physical property, you're buying land. When you're buying an online business, you're also buying property, but you're buying digital property. You're buying yourself a space online where you can get an income stream. And the cool thing about it, most people don't even know this This industry is evolving or even exists. And I was speaking to a CEO of Flipper just last week, and we were talking about how a lot of people will buy, go out and buy a car for 10, 20, 30, or 50K, right? And I often say to people, what happens, you know, when you buy a car, how much do you spend? And they tell me the price. And then I ask them, okay, cool. So how much money does that car make you? <laughs> and it's a, often a co cost them money, right? It's a liability. Right. And so I also tell them like, look, for the same price as a car, you could buy a website business. And the entry to get your foot in the door is a lot easier compared to buying physical property. So the way I see this is the multiples are only rising for online businesses at the moment. And it really is a seller's market. So if you have a website and you want to sell it, it's there's, a, there's an abundance of people who want to buy them. And that's why I see this grow, still growing. And I do hear, you know, and I do see, and I keep my finger on the pulse with uh, the big R recession word. And it's been drawn out for a long time. I know Robert Kiyosaki, uh, I've actually got his book, The Second Chance. He wrote that, I think, back in 2016 when I read it. And it's just been, it's just been drawn out. And I also held back from buying businesses in that year. And then I thought, oh, maybe I'll buy another one. And so I did. And I'm glad I did because I've got my full 100% return on my investment back from that. And it's still growing. And if a recession happens, then I'm okay with that. It just makes that it makes a, the entry point even cheaper for me yeah. and for everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of uh, Robert Kiyosaki, his, the book he's most famous for is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And in that book, which I loved, he describes uh, or defines an asset as something that puts money in your pocket every month and a liability is something that takes money out of your pocket every month. So that house that you live in and you're paying a mortgage on is a liability because it's taking money out of your pocket every month. If you have a house that is a rental property, you rent out, you're, you're the landlord, now that's an asset. And, and that's a very powerful distinction because a lot of... Um, this would apply to online properties as well. If you have a property that is taking money out of your pocket every month, that is a liability. It's just an online liability, right? So, oh, I've got this website and uh, it's not really, 
it's just kind of a showpiece for me, my services, and my uh, you know speaking and all that. Well, if that's not actually generating any income for you, that is a liability. So you need to turn that into an income source and and make it an asset then. Yeah, it's such a good point. And I think it's scary because I've grown up with same as what the American dream is over here in Australia is the Australian dream is, you know, grow up, buy a house, you know, um, get a car, get everything, you know, sorted, but it's all on credit. And there's one thing to have good debt and one thing to have bad debt. And Robert Kiyosaki talks about this a lot as well. And when you buy a house, you know, or buy something with uh, debt or, you know, finance, normally you'd want that to bring in more income than what the finance repayments are. But when you buy something like a house, it's a liability and it's, it ends up being not the best type of debt, really. So it's a great point. Yeah, yeah. But then there's this concept of OPM, other people's money. So if I can buy five, I don't know, uh, properties, real estate or online properties that are mostly other people's money, but I have a stake in it, that might be worth a lot more to me in the long term than me just using all of my funds you know, taking uh, all my my liquid assets and making them illiquid, buying that property uh, and not using any uh, debt or other people's money. Yeah, and the cool thing about using other people's money is that if you control that asset and it's making an income, they just give you some money and it's completely passive for them where they get a return, which is really cool. And that's where, you know, I'm sort of heading in this space as well is, is going down and setting up those types of investments and, and helping people fund sites and stuff like that. Um, cause it's, a, it's an exciting thing. It's an ever, ever growing industry now and some big things to come from it. So I'm pretty excited for it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, there's a niche in this space that's occupied by companies like income store, which is actually a client of mine that they make it a lot easier for the investor or the uh, the potential website owner to buy a website and operate it because they don't have to be an expert in everything from SEO to e-commerce to uh, analytics and email marketing and social media marketing and all you know, like pay-per-click, all of it, right? So they yeah. manage all that, but then they take half of the income uh, every month and they take half of the the sale price once it sells. So you, you as the site partner own the property, but you have essentially like a a, a management firm. Uh, like yeah, you know, this this happens in real team. estate, right? You so see, you don't want to exactly. clean the toilet. I mean, you don't want to like repair the toilets of the the, the various renters' uh, places. So you, you hire a, a property management company to, to take care of that for you, and they get paid every month. But in this case, uh, the incentives are, are more aligned because the, it's in their best interest and in yours as the site partner to grow that asset, which is pretty cool and uh, I think a, a pretty unique business model. I don't, do you know of any other companies besides Income Store that are doing it this way? Yeah, there's quite a few. Yeah. Um, there's, yeah, there's a probably about a handful now that are doing it. Maybe even up to ten that I, maybe just under ten that I'd know of. Oh, wow. um, and it's it's a it's becoming more of a common practice with the same, you know, uh, you know, it's, say somebody's going to come and invest with our, our fund that we're setting up. You know, it's the same as what a lot of people are offering is they can put the money into the pool. We can buy a site. We'll take a management fee out of it. Uh, and then, you know, if they're going to sell it within a certain time frame, usually within under 12 months, where we're still eligible to take half the sale price as well. So it'd be in our best interest to grow in a short time frame to get a part of that sale price. And then also with the, the owner or the, you know, the, the main owner who's got a bigger stake in the business, it's within their best, best interest for us to grow it in a quicker time frame so they can get in and out and buy another one and grow another one. And it's just, it's kind of like, when you're flipping houses, it's the, there's so many. It's so relatable to property, because if people want to buy a, a rundown house, they can buy a rundown website as well. They can come in and renovate it, do it up, and then flip it in six to twelve months and and make a lot more money because they added a much more value to it. As you got, that's what a lot of people are doing with 
websites too. So it's just a, a lower entry point, right? When you go to buy a house in between 200 to 500K, you could do this with a you know 50 to 150K website. Right, and, and is there a certain uh, kind of sweet spot for uh, the price of, of a website? Are we talking mostly 50 to 150K? Are we talking, you know, you can buy a, a, a pretty decent website for 20 or 30K, or are the best ones really in 500K and up price point? Like, mm -hmm. where's the sweet spot in your in your view? Yeah, it's... I like to always stick to the, the get what you get what you pay for it. And a lot of people will come to me and, and they might have saved up over years, saved up 10 to 20 K and that's, you know, you're not going to get the same quality of business if you spend up to sort of 50 K on your first website, anything over the 50 K mainly towards the hundred K it's a, it's a lot easier cause it's more established. Um, I like to, I like to see people buy sites between, you know, if they're a beginner, between 50 to 250. If they've got a little bit more money, buy something between, you know, 100 to 150 and, and 500K because that's where you you end up having more time for yourself and you can be a CEO and an investor rather than be an operator. And most people who get into this space want to do this to have a better lifestyle. So it's you can achieve your goals a lot quicker if you do have those finances or if you do use OPM, other people's money. Mm -hmm. You know, and you could get finance like an SBA loan, which is quite common now. Um, I, with all my clients, I have um, a lot of brokers that I push people towards, and they get help setting up finance and stuff like that. So there's different ways you can finance this, but. If you buy, yeah, I prefer people to buy something, you know, in between the 100, 150 and 500K range because okay. it's, it just makes it a better lifestyle for them and a better income. Yeah, that, that makes sense. It's like if, if you're going to buy a house, you don't want to buy a house for twenty to $50,000. I mean, that's going to be <laughs> a really uh, <laughs> bad place in a very bad neighborhood, Yeah. right? So uh, you yeah. got to be realistic about what, what an online business that's a, a legit online business is going to be worth and, and, and what sort of um, valuations do you typically see or do you recommend yeah so the valuation it depends on how micro and macro we go with this but we'll, we'll say very macro it's similar to an offline business at the moment where you're getting about a three-year multiple or, or a 36, they do it in months with websites as well, 36-month uh, multiple. Uh, it, that then also depends on the business model. There's some business models that have less risk, uh, such as like subscription or memberships type sites where there's a recurring income coming in. So you can buy yourself into recurring income. And, you know, normally their multiples will be a bit higher. You might see them up around three and a half to four. Uh, but other sites that may be really heavy reliant on something like a lot of ad spend, you know, the multiples may be a bit lower. So I've had clients that have bought sites with a 10 month multiple, so less than a one year multiple. And then I've had clients that have bought them, you know, around the three month multiple. So it does vary, but normally at it used to be 25 to 30% return on investment per year. Now it's up around the, you know, the three year multiple. So you're seeing about a 30, you know, well, it, it's, yeah, it's still roughly 25 to 30%. It was actually more percentage before. It was like 30 to 40. It depends on, like, the industry is growing in a way where it's a seller's market, so they can sell their businesses for a lot more and achieve a, a higher multiple for it because there's so many buyers. So at the moment, you'd see roughly a 25 to 30% return on your investment per year, which is when you look at real estate and you look at stocks, I mean, the investment is is quite uh, the return is quite large compared and a lot of people don't know this exists so when they go and see website brokers and they can actually see you know how much the website costs how much you know uh, they're making in revenue and income what their expenses are and they can also also see what work is required and how many hours are required to run that business as well so they can get a full a full scope of the business quite quickly just by looking at each listing like when you somebody lists uh, a property for sale 
it's the same as listing a website for sale. You can list it on a, on a website broker, just like a real estate broker. So yeah, that information is all there for everybody to go see. Interesting. Okay. So, uh, would you recommend that somebody only go through a broker to buy a website or, uh, can they find opportunities on their own? Look, you can find opportunities on your own. It is a lot harder. Uh, there are places like marketplaces like Flipper and Exchange Marketplace. You can come to these sites and buy sites directly from the seller, although there's a broker definitely plays a good role. When you buy straight from a seller, normally they haven't sold a site before, so they don't know what sort of information they need to give you, and they can be fumbling around, and it can be hard to extract that information, and it can be harder for you to do due diligence. Uh, and then it also causes a bit of, you know, it causes some people to be a bit anxious about, hey, if this person hasn't sold a business before, and they don't know what they're actually doing, like, ha when they're selling it, how do they, how do I have confidence in them knowing how to run their business as well? Mm. So. You can pick it up for a lower multiple if you want to go through that process. Uh, and I did that myself with my first website business. And then I quickly converted over to buying from brokers because brokers have all the information. They play a very good role in this. And normally what I see is the better listings are from brokers. Okay, got it. And so um, what are brokers typically earning uh, in terms of the transaction? Is it? 10%, 20%, like how, do, how does that r relate to, let's say, uh, a realtor? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's cool that it's so similar because it's a lot of people get real estate. It's very similar. Uh, well, it, it depends on the, the price, right? So if somebody's selling a 500K site, they're going to get a little bit less commission than uh, selling a 50K site. So selling something around the 50K, they may be in between the 10 to 50 15 percent ish i don't know anybody that's doing a 20 percent and then you can also you know go up to as minimal as seven percent you know for the, the, their listing businesses for you know some of them are listing businesses for 30 mil so this this is where bigger fund and pooling of money are coming together to buy those bigger 30 mil 10 20 30 40 mil businesses uh so they'd get a, a much smaller percentage on that and it may be you know two to five percent so it depends on the size of the business, but yeah, you get anywhere from, you know, two down, two up to 15%-ish. Mm, okay. And uh, I, I had an interview with Chuck Mullins a, a while back who does some uh, work for Quiet Light Brokerage. He's a serial entrepreneur. And so he would buy a bunch of websites. He'd sell websites and so forth. And he uh, started working with Quiet Light. Uh, quite a lot, and then he, uh, he decided he liked them enough that he would uh, work with them, and uh, that was a pretty interesting interview. So uh, he, he talked about some of the uh, benefits of working with a broker, due diligence that's uh, required, and, and how they do some of that, and what some of the things are to look out for, some of those gotchas where you could end up getting scammed if you're not careful. Uh, so that was a great interview. Uh, listeners, if you check out that uh, episode, I think that'll be worth your time. But I'm I'm curious. Besides Quiet Light Brokerage, which I've heard good things about, uh, and I'm I'm guessing you have too. Are are there others that you would recommend, or that uh, you've used in the past, or your clients have used? I, I know it's hard yeah. to pick favorites because, of course, <laughs> then that uh, somebody's not listed as one of your favorites, and they be like, "Hey, I thought we were friends." <laughs> so I'm not asking you it to is, pick favorites. Like, no, don't pick. Yeah, your favorite it is kid hard. Be, <laughs> yeah, it is hard because I know a lot of people in the space and a lot of brokers um, with my clients buying from a, a larger, you know, uh, vast array of, of brokers. I have been on the Quiet Light Brokerage podcast myself before. They are good. They're very good. Um, you've also got Digital Exits. You've got um, Empire Flippers and FE International. Uh, they're two of the go-to brokers that we normally buy from. So I've just had a client who's finished up with a, 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 was about a 500K listing with FE International. Um, and in the last month, we bought through Empire Flippers. So I bought through Empire and, and you know, we've, those are the two go-to brokers. We, we also definitely look at digital exits and quiet light. And some different brokers have different 
different price range of or price bracket of sites. So you may have some that are just selling sites from a million to 20 million. And for the person who's just getting in, it's not a viable option for them straight away. Uh, and then, you know, so some I've even got some people that are buying from Flipper and Exchange Marketplace because they're able to buy those sites that are, you know, between 10 to 40K. And they know they know what's involved. They know it's going to be a little bit more work um, for them, but that's where they're prepared to get into and, and start really pulling up the sleeves. And it does help to get into that style of operator to at least learn about the online space um, to then become a better CEO when you do buy a bigger listings. But they, they would be my kind of go-to brokers and marketplaces that people can go and check out. And they can just jump on Google, find them. And even if they Google website brokers, there's going to be a bunch that will pop up. And it's really cool to see the listing price, how much they're making per month and how much it's costing per month and work out, okay, how long would it take me to make my 100% return on investment back? And then the wheel starts ticking and then you go, oh, well, I'm, it's maybe something I need to get into. Mm-hmm. Um, what, have, what have you heard about or experience with uh, Latonas? Uh, Latonas, I've looked at a lot of sites through them. Um, some of my sites, some of my clients, sorry, have looked at a lot of sites through them. I've never gone and bought through them. Um, but yeah, we've we've never proceeded just because it hasn't, you know, we we haven't seen the business investments um, viable for each investor. Yeah, have you have you worked with them? Um, I haven't, but uh, I, I had some conversations with uh, with Tony, their founder, uh, because uh, he was looking for SEO, <laughs> and so he was uh, considering hiring uh, me and my company to help them with SEO. Uh, so. Yeah, he's been on the pod. They've been, I've had them on the podcast as well. Yeah, um, yeah. Smart, and, smart and they guy. are, they are, they they're very good. Yeah, they're good brokers, but we just haven't picked up any from there yet. So okay. So uh, what are some of the criteria that you would recommend a listener uh, use when determining whether they're going to use that particular broker or not? Like, what are strengths and weaknesses uh, that they're trying to to gauge with these different brokers? That's a good question. I. I would suggest like I'm big on building relationships with people because it's not about like I'm going to buy one business. It's, you know, if you're going to do this, you can do this for the long term and the more people that you can become friends with and not like a robot become friends, but like actually be a good human being about it, then the easier it is for you to go through and buy businesses. So a big criteria for me when you're looking through brokers is, how easy is it for you to contact them and build a relationship with them and and either stay in contact? Also, like, are they listening to you? Sometimes, you know, I know Empire Flippers, they have um, pre-calls with investors and, and say, hey, like, how much do you want to spend? What are you looking to get? And they'll actually go away and start putting businesses in front of them that are within that criteria. Um, so that's another sort of criteria on looking for a broker. And then, you know, how how much are they on the broker side? I mean, on the on the seller side as opposed to the, the buyer side. If they're very in the middle, it's very good, you know. And it, there's so many. My biggest thing would be building relationships and how and how easily do they help you? Yeah. Um, the price the price range wouldn't really be a big thing for me because, you know, give and take when you're buying a a hundred, say just a hundred and fifty k site, give and take a couple of thousand dollars, is it is, isn't a big thing. I'd rather have a better relationship with the broker and be more confident than trying to skimp out on a couple of grand. Yeah, and also have them be more aligned with your interests too. If they're more balanced in that regard, just like if uh, you're working with a realtor and they really want to unload this property that uh, you know they're, they're they're representing the seller. And it's just not moving, not moving. And, oh, we got a live one here. <laughs> Let's unload this property on you. And, and mm. then, yeah, that, that could be bad, having the online equivalent of that. Yeah, especially for me. Like, I'm, I'm pretty energetic when, when I see a good investment. I, I, I try my hardest to just be non-emotional about it. And it's the same when somebody who is a, a brand new to buying a website is I teach them how to become a very attractive buyer 
and to be how to be a savage buyer and uh, not a savage a savvy <laughs> not a savage <laughs> like don't be savage guys <laughs> but be a savvy buyer <laughs> uh where they're investing without their emotions and they're relying on a lot of the logic so it brokers can tell the difference when people are first time investors and when they're not and if you can get as much education behind you which is what i do is i am help people empower themselves to make the right decisions and and go through the process the right way mm. yep that's good so don't be savage <laughs> <laughs> don't be savage <laughs> Okay, so how many uh, sites do you have in your portfolio currently? Yeah, so I've got three in my portfolio at the moment, uh, and we're looking at expanding in yeah, the new year, which is exciting. So I'm starting to look at some uh, listings in the new year and, and building this fund. Right, so, so yeah. what does that look like? Like you're getting OPM, other people's money, and uh, uh, you're looking to acquire what, like a a bunch of different websites or just a few more like what what does this fund look like yeah so you've got when you when you start it depends on how big you you want your fund to be you can buy a, a platform business and a platform business could be a lesser price than the other businesses that you may bolt on to the businesses business as well so you can buy a platform business and add on or bolt on businesses what they they call them which help grow that website with it'll be either in the same niche or it'll be similar and it can help grow that platform business as long as well as the bolt on business. So uh, at the moment we'll be looking for something that can be a platform with the addition to bolt on. Uh, we're not going to go super fast with it. We want to make sure we ensure that we're doing the best we can with our team and growing and, and not splitting our focus too much, but focusing on the first one that we buy and ensure that our investors get, you know, a, a really good return. Like we'd rather work with that and that be a bigger, that be the most important goal than just building something ridiculous. Because if you tarnish those relationships with the investors, you know, that can, that can cause a massive ripple effect. And some people can, their ego can blind them from like, hey, I want to be really big, really quick and be seen as this, you know, type of fund or whatever. It's, that's not important. The people are important. Yeah. And the investors are important. And if we if we ensure that that's our goal, then we, we'll do well. So we're not going to try and, and, you know, do our first fund and, and raise 10 mil. We've already got people that are, you know, coming to us with some funds and we're taking taking a bit of a list. But, yeah, it's it's first a platform business and we'll work from there, ensuring along the way that our investors get yeah. a good return and want to stick with this long term, you know, not just a, a two, three year thing, but 10 20 right, years right. so slow and steady wins the race and and also exactly think of the long game too and I, i'm i'm curious what sort of returns are typical uh i, I know this is a tough question to, <laughs> to put yeah. in front of you because you don't want to make any promises and uh you don't want to set up unrealistic expectations and then have disappointed investors for your fund but uh you know, I'm I'm guessing there are other funds out there that you can invest in. And yep. what what's typical? What's 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 out there in the industry in in the ranges of uh, percentage uh, uh, returns per per year? Yeah. So it really depends. There are funds where you can you can invest with them, and they will grow and manage the business and they'll pay, they'll take out a management fee and give you a higher return on your investment. And then there's some that will just take a part of the income and then give you a part of the income. And then it depends on what the goal of that investment may be. So for example, say if it's income storm, income store, sorry, or a, another fund where they may buy it for the, the investor, they may have a goal of, growing it within a year and flipping it. So they may say, all right, cool, we're going to grow it and we're going to take uh, 10 to 15% of the return per quarter or per month and give you the rest of the return. And then after that, we, you know, if we sell the site within a year, we'll take 50 of, of what we sell it for and then you take 50 as well. Uh, and 
that can be an option. Then you've got other funds that may just pay, you know, anywhere from five to 15% uh, per year. And it can be a continual and then compounding growth as well on top of that. So you may get like bonus, bonus growth per month or per, you know, quarter when the business grows and fluctuates, but you will, will have a base and a minimum. So I'd love to answer that and be specific on what our fund is going to be and what others are, but they do vary and it's very dependent on what the investor is, is looking yeah. for as well. And one thing to look out for is are your incentives and outcomes aligned with the, the, the person managing the fund or the, the, the broker or, or the, you know, yeah. the, the consultant or the coach that you're working with, because mm. if, um, I don't know if you've read the book Freakonomics before, but it's one of my favorite business books. Yeah, he's got super Freakonomics as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. So there's this uh, concept in the book that if the if there's misalignment in the incentives, that's where you end up with things like teachers cheating on their students' behalf so that they don't get fired uh, for having poor yeah. performing students, or uh, sumo wrestlers that are throwing um, uh, matches because uh, you know, there, there's incentive in, uh, for them to do that and stuff like that. You would be very surprised to hear uh, happens, but it's just baked into the system and, and it's just kind of inevitable that that kind of cheating or, uh, you know, tr working a a around the uh, the person they're supposed to be helping, uh, that that's kind of baked into the system a lot of times. Yeah. It really is. And this is why being fully upfront with your investors and not trying to just, you know, tell them one thing and do that thing, but also do a couple of other things around that thing. And coming back to go even deeper to that is for an investor, you just need to really sit down and go through that person's content or have really com good conversations with them and open conversations and it comes back to trust. So a lot of people that work with me, it's not because they want my information and, you know, it's, it's mainly, and same with you, you know, they work with you because they have that trust, right? And that's the biggest thing is you, you want to find somebody that you want to invest with that you actually trust. So go through and have conversations with people and go through and, and check out their content, check out what they're offering and see if it like the feeling there in your gut and in your intuition, it actually feels within alignment of what you actually want, right? Because maybe you'll find a fund that will pay less of a return, but you have more confidence in, just like what we were talking about before. So yep. yeah, yeah. That's a very good point. That's a very good point in having that alignment, yeah. yeah and and um, I'm curious if there are opportunities to buy like a portfolio of sites at a time. Like uh, I didn't know this until recent years, but you can buy a block of houses and pay as little as ten or twenty thousand dollars per house because you're buying a block <laughs> of ten or twenty. And, and many of those are not houses you would want to own but then there's some uh, gems in there that potentially that uh, are worth a lot more uh does that happen in the online world yeah it does you've got and they can be uh sites that are selling for even 50k where you can buy two to three sites in one all the way up to bigger you know you know two million to 20 million dollar blocks or you know groups of, of websites that may be a platform with some bolt-ons as well. Uh, it, it is common, you know, the smaller ones are normally where you're buying a site with a PBN bolted onto it, which isn't something that I or yourself yeah, would no. <laughs> completely suggest at all. But so don't do that guys. If you see the word PBN, just big yeah, red just, flag there. Just think the word uh, termites. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Run. You're not going to get a building and pest check um, complete on that. So, yeah, there's definitely group buyers that you can you can buy them together. But you and when somebody's doing such a thing, you I would suggest really doing 
you know, you're going to do your research and due diligence either way, but really posing the question, how valuable is are these sites or this other extra site to the growth of the main business and how is that going to play out in the future if we if it keeps running the way yeah. it is yeah so what are some of the things that um, a, a buyer of a site or, or block of sites would need to do or should do in terms of their due diligence yeah so there's there's a few main ones you've got traffic you want to check your traffic and all of your seo so i try to keep traffic a bit separate from seo you want to you want to make sure the traffic's trending up or down sideways and which way and why you want to know the demographic so definitely traffic and then you've got seo and that can be on page seo off page seo and then you've got financials you want to check the financials you want to make sure that the income is actually coming in and it's the right income that they say is coming in so cross-reference everything from the profit and loss statement to a screen shave. You can get viewers access of their business's merchant account or their Shopify account. Uh, and then also marketing. Checking out their marketing is a big part of the due diligence for sure. And my, my favorite part of due diligence and what I find is the most important is one thing that people just don't get right and it's the seller call. And the seller call is when you get to get on the phone and you have a bunch of questions ready for the seller and you just learn so much more about the business in that one call that may be a half an hour to an hour call than most of what you may have learned in the data that you've been given for the due diligence in the prospectus. So they would be the main things to cover throughout your due diligence. And do you have a, like a cheat sheet of, of the best questions to ask during that uh, seller call? Of course you do. Yeah, right? I do. <laughs> I've, I've got cheat sheets for all the different types of business models as, as a part of what my community gets. But I've also got uh, a framework. So I've got a due diligence framework, which for beginners, they can get for free if they want. Um, you can just head to my site and it's a, it, it tells you each part of the due diligence and what questions you need to ask about the business, not specific to the seller, but ask, a, ask about what they need to know to ensure that they can get the right information throughout their due diligence. Gotcha. Uh, and so uh, you, you mentioned your community. What do your community members get uh, on a like um, ongoing basis or, or what sort of one-off kind of resources are they going to definitely want to get, like that checklist of questions and things like that? Yeah, so if people jump into the community, what they get is they get – Obviously, the community, which is a network of people that are buying, growing, and selling sites, you know, five, six, seven-figure income earners in there. Um, we've got a good caliber of people. Like they say, your network is your net worth. So they get the community, and then you've also got the uh, the course and the content. So I've created a course on, like, it's kind of a zero-to-hero course on how to buy a website. Uh, and you get all that data information and then trainings from me uh, and other experts and stuff like that. Uh, the biggest draw card is the support, right? People aren't buying. People aren't just buying the information. They're what they're doing is they're buying the support, and the, not just the support of the community, but the support of me. And I help people. I do due diligence reviews. So that's a massive draw card. Is that when they done the work and they've done all the due diligence, I can come in and I can have a quick look at the business and do a quick review with them and say, maybe you need to ask this question or this may be a red flag, find out this information and empower them to really buy the business themselves, but with just somebody watching over their shoulder. And that's the main thing is I want to teach people to buy these websites so they can not just eat, you know, not catch a fish, not just get somebody given a fish and they can eat dinner for a night, but teach somebody to catch the fish so they can eat dinner for the rest of the lifetime. That's the principle of what I like to teach is so they can build their own portfolio and they don't need to keep hiring me and they don't need to keep working with me for, you know, to do it in the long term. Yeah, that's my philosophy too with SEO is that I, I want to teach my clients how to fish so that they can pull up a site and know what to look for. Like, all right, let's take a look at uh, robots.txt file. Let's look at the XML sitemaps. Let's look at... Um, uh, the different reports in Ahrefs and SEMrush and similar web and all that sort of stuff. Let's uh, kind of diagnose and 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 reverse engineer uh, 
what's right and wrong with the SEO of this particular website. And that website might be your own, or it might be a competitor's, or it might be a potential uh, acquisition. So yeah. it's, it's, it's like having a superpower when you're really good at that. Yeah, it's because you do that audit, yeah. right? Which which is so valuable. And then, you know, when people learn from that audit and how to do that, it's it's the best it's the best value you can give to somebody because it's compounding value. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm curious, what what is your take on aftermarket domains? So there's no website to go with it. It could have been some really sketchy website before. It may have never been a website, just a parking page or just a you know, it doesn't the website doesn't even resolve and you're buying the domain. Mm. There are tons of websites out there where you could um look at aftermarket domains like uh, Afternick and Cedo and HugeDomains.com and BuyDomains.com and so forth. Mm. And, and mm. sometimes I'll help my clients buy an aftermarket domain because it's uh, a really good potential brand name for them. But, you know, there's nothing that comes with it in terms of content or the link equity is probably going to get reset to zero when you buy it because Google is going to know it's really hard to fool Google into thinking that uh, the site hasn't changed ownership. It probably doesn't even have any uh, link equity anyways because it was most likely a parking page for all those years. So, uh, yeah, tell, tell me what your take is on aftermarket domains. Wow, such a good question. We had this question come up in the group a couple of weeks ago and somebody was looking at a site that was built on an expired domain. And it they had a lot of links going to the site still and i was very confused like you said it, it, it should be refreshed and the links weren't relevant so they weren't relevant links which as if google sees this and they haven't rectified it it's going to cause bad you know not the greatest seo for the website right and so it wasn't i i posed the question I didn't just tell them what to do, right? It's not what I do is I don't just go, hey, you should do this or don't buy it. I, I ask them the questions to empower themselves to really understand this is the right thing to do. So I asked, you know, what, is, what work do you need to do to get rid of those links and to rebuild this back up to, to ground zero and then and build from there? And there was a lot of work required in doing that. And so the next question was, what, you know, is that, how much would that cost? And adding that onto the investment that you're already going to pay, is it worthwhile doing that for the p potential return that you're going to make? And so the, the answer was no. So in this, in this case, it wasn't the best investment to buy something with that had been built on with an expired domain. Now I'd be much more confident with your help. If you were helping myself or my client buy an expired domain because you'd have a, a, a far better audit than myself because you've been in this space for a lot longer in, in the SEO on auditing that actual expired domain. So yes, there you can buy bad uh, existing domains that aren't going to be too ben too beneficial, and then you can also buy good ones. Um, yeah, what's your take on it? Yeah, so. Well, I think it's important to distinguish an expired domain from an aftermarket domain that hasn't expired, right? So yes. if someone uh, lets a domain expire, that's a signal that Google is going to pick up on because they're they they know that a lot of PBNs are built up on or private blog networks are built up on expired domains, and the hope is that the 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 spammer, <laughs> the uh, black hat person, is going to be able to reap some rewards from that expired domain from all the link equity that was acquired over time. Uh, and of course, it's uh, uh, Google's um, uh, desire to reset that page rank to a zero <laughs> so that they get no benefit from that. Mm. That's a very different situation because you're almost like playing in a, in a, in a, bad neighborhood there with going after expired domains uh it's very very challenging and uh it's easy for google to catch what what's going on whereas an aftermarket domain let's say that um the site has just hypothetically never changed ownership 
It's been sitting in some domainer's portfolio for 10 years. They never got what they wanted for it, so they just held on to it, and they have thousands of other domains, so it's not keeping them up at night. And then you finally come with an offer that they're willing to accept. And then how do I leverage any link equity that that aftermarket domain has? Probably it has none because it was just sitting in their portfolio with a parking page, and who's going to link to that, right? Whereas an expired domain... Uh, is probably a previous website that you're hoping to fool Google into thinking that, oh, no, those are my links. <laughs> I earned those <laughs> links, right? <laughs> so an aftermarket domain where you're kind of changing your brand name or you're developing a brand and everything good is already taken, especially with dot-coms. Everything good is taken, so you're going to have to pony up th- at least a thousand, several thousand dollars to get anything halfway decent, I mean, occasionally you'll find something good uh, for a, a lesser price point. Like I, I did buy, uh, for example, um, uh, sciencevesio.com for like $600. Cool. Uh, that was, That's a great buy. Yeah, yeah. And, and it did have an existing site on it, but nothing that I wanted to keep. So I didn't care about trying to retain any link equity to to that previous site because it wasn't that much. And I I just, you know. It was, uh, I had other plans for it. And, and then, um, yeah, so if you, if you think about which scenario you're dealing with and what your end game is, that's going to in, inform your decision-making process. That's, that's my, my view on it. Yeah, I think, that, and that's, that's, that's great to distinguish the two difference, um, aftermarket and expired, because expired is just, you can see it's quite easily a, kind of a no-go zone but the aftermarket if one of my clients was going to go away and buy an aftermarket domain i would be asking the question how how link worthy would that domain be you know is it something that is aligned like you're talking about we're talking about long before is that something that is aligned with the core ethics values and morals of the business and is it going to be the best domain to showcase what those ethics, morals, and values are that are going to create it uh, a more link-worthy domain. Yeah, yeah. And I actually interviewed uh, a, a domainer who focuses on expired domains, surprisingly, but to build oh. legitimate sites on them. So he's pouring over expired uh, domain lists on a daily basis. It's just kind of a part of his morning r- routine kind of like how some people read the newspaper. He's reading expired domain lists and stuff. <laughs> and he's picked up some good ones. Uh, a couple of his online businesses now are Vi- like VidaliaOnions.com, I think, is uh, a site he, he owns. Uh, he picked up, I believe, as an expired domain. Um, uh, DudeRanch.com or DudeRanches.com, one or the other. I forget which one is his as well. Ooh. And he built up like a, like a BedAndBreakfast.com, but for Dude Ranches. <laughs> at, at, at that site so um yeah he's got a pretty cool story if you uh want to check out that episode listeners it's uh peter ask you um yeah so i'm i'm now wanting to go into the uh area of let's say that you want to find a diamond in the rough that the uh the the site owner has some sort of um, I don't know, challenge that they're facing at the moment. You know, the best kind of real estate property, for example, that you uh, could buy is one where you're buying it from a don't wanter, right? So yep. that, that that's a term from Robert uh, Allen, from Bob Allen, who is also on this podcast. Um, How awesome. Yeah, I have all the cool, cool people on. Uh, you do. <laughs> I've seen it. <laughs> so he talks about don't wanters as like the... the they don't want to to have that property anymore. Like they can't afford it anymore, or they've outgrown it, or they've downsized and you know, empty nest or whatever. There's some reason why they don't want it. I guess the property itself is called the don't wanter, right? So you're you're yep. looking for these don't wanters, which are the properties that um, there there's a reason why it's got to come off their books. Right, or it's got to come. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just get off of their asset uh, sheet. So, if you think of the online equivalent to that, there are, there must be millions of websites where 
they're going through a health challenge or a death in the family or uh, a, 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 maybe they got laid off or some you know financial uh, issue. They got um, uh, an immediate need for money f- for whatever reason. Something happened and they need to unload the property, but they don't know where to turn. They don't know about brokers. They don't know the first thing about this whole industry. And you just happen to be the first one to knock on the door. And and one one technique that I learned about from uh, a real estate uh, p- person, it wasn't Bob, but somebody else, who said that uh, he calls up uh, folks that are um, listing places for rent in the newspapers. And if the place keep or, or on online sites, and then if the place keeps showing up week after week, that's a good sign that it could be a don't wanter, because they can't fill that that place with another renter, and that's probably mm. pretty stressful. And so they're uh, relieved to get a call like, "Oh my God, huh? You, so you want to rent my place? <laughs> that's awesome." No, no, oh, actually, no. Sorry, I don't want to rent it. But would you I be willing? Cash. Would you be willing to sell it? And th- that might catch them off guard, but th- you'd be surprised. Some people will uh, will entertain that. So if you can be the only uh, person they're talking to because they haven't started thinking about using a broker or a real estate agent or whatever, that's that's a great opportunity, right? It's a massive opportunity. It's something I definitely teach my clients as well is that you can go for off-market opportunities and there's specific like uh, ways that you can contact them and, you know, sort of see that, hey, you know, I'd maybe be interested in, it's more of a passion buying a business that your, you know, your dream business because you can go, you know, off market deals, you can poach anyone or any business. And if it's something like, hey, I'm obsessed with surfing, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll love this, look at this this website. I'll, uh, and I've been following it for a while. Maybe I'll just contact them and, and sort of start, building a relationship around that, see if they want to buy them. So um, back to back to your question about the don't want us, there's so many ways to find opportunities for, um, on these don't want us. I've had people that have wanted to sell websites because they, a kid, he wanted to, you know, sell his site so we could afford to go to college. And then I've had people, same with the health problems, want to sell sites so they could, you know, get their surgery and all that sort of stuff. Um, now, that's you when you buy a site like that you're actually doing that person a service no matter what that you know what that need is you're actually helping them get what they want which is important too so you're actually filling in this gap here and then when you do take it over those things that you can do or opportunities that you can see uh for me is i'm an opportunist (laughs) uh is i i certainly see a plethora of things right so for me it's working out what should i push away and not distract myself with and what should I focus on mostly and you know a lot of the times we see things that email lists aren't touched and haven't been you know contacted in a long time but they've got a good list right so you could start working up that's free marketing for you know everybody listening they're into marketing right that's free marketing for a list that hasn't been touched and you know email marketing massive opportunity right and then you've also got things like you know, if you're really good at marketing uh, on Facebook ads, YouTube, Google ads, whatever it is, you may see the marketing profile and say, well, I could do some of these types of things or this person doesn't even have a pixel on their website and they're not doing any remarketing or abandoned carts, things like that. Um, same with SEO, Stefan. When you come in and you look at a site and you're like, Whoa, all I'd need to do is a link detox and a little bit of this sort of stuff and you know, a few tweaks and I could, re- that's a massive growth opportunity. So there's, I actually in my community uh, is sometimes I'll go through and I'll look at websites that are list for sale and I'll do a screen share and I'll just share like 20 things on each site that I could do to improve it and grow it. And then also tell them what the risks are and then weigh it up. Is it worth getting those opportunities um, with those risks that are involved? So like I love, that's one of my things I love to see in businesses. Like how can I, how can I build this? Right. Yeah, like if you look at a content site and you think, wow, this is in a topic area that I'm really passionate about. Uh, I think that this uh, 
website owner is in that kind of situation where they they have a don't wanter, they need to uh, move on. And there's so much opportunity to grow the traffic or uh, to monetize. Maybe they aren't monetizing at all. There's not even Google AdSense um, on the site, or they're, they're not using Mediavine or AdThrive or um, they don't have any affiliate links on, on the site. And you say, wow, this is a great content site that I could just slide in all these monetization opportunities and start making immediate cash from it. And they're probably making nothing off of it. So I could maybe get it for, mm-hmm. uh, a, you know, a, a, a good, very good price. Cause what's the multiple of zero, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, you basically be picking up a shell, um, and putting some monetization strategies into it. And, you know, that's a good flip it strategy is you could, you could pick it up. Who knows? You may be able to pick up a shell for like five grand, you know, um, and it could be less. I wouldn't go too low because then there would be more, you know, red flags or problems that could be involved with it. But you could pick something up for five grand, put some, um, you know, good affiliate articles in uh, and throw up some AdSense that isn't hindrance, hindrance to the viewer. And, you know, over a year, you might scale some income and then you put it back on the market and you could sell it for 30 grand or, you know, probably more, 40 grand. Mm-hmm. Or you buy a content site that's a bigger one that is somebody's uh, kind of main focus. Maybe it's fifty grand, and then you grow it to four hundred grand because uh, they haven't done a very good job with monetization or SEO or what have you. Yeah. Yeah, and this is a this is a big thing of with the people that don't want us as well is they may get their website to a certain level of growth that they can achieve because they've only grown themselves a certain level yeah. and they may hit a wall of resistance in personal growth or business growth. And a lot of people do that. We've always faced with these little obstacles. Like my favorite book is the obstacles away. And some people may not want to th- push through that threshold. And so with that, you know, people just go, Oh, I give up. I don't want it. put it up for sale. And then there's somebody that comes along such as yourself or myself or, you know, either of our clients that go, what, this is an opportunity and they have already been past that wall that that person hasn't broken yet. And they can just take, take advantage of that opportunity. Yeah. Do you have any kind of special tools or, uh, did you build anything internal, any kind of algorithm or whatever that will help you find these, these don't wanters or these, these, uh, diamonds in the rough? I don't have any, uh, specific, software built no i do have uh little like i guess you could call them sops um so little processes that people can do the first is really setting up i help people find out where their goals and guidelines are right so it's really important for people to understand what they really want because i bought businesses before where i'm like well, this isn't really something that's going to help me achieve the, the goals that I want or it's not within my guidelines. And I just got overwhelmed by, oh, this is making all this all this awesome money. I want to be there and earn that. So I really take people back to ground zero and say, like, what are your goals and guidelines? It's going to be, you know, you got to have financial goals and you've got to have lifestyle goals and it, uh, then create some guidelines. So you have like five to six guidelines of what the website would be. And then you can go out and find these ones that are the don't wanters that are aligned with that. And then I have a little, uh, a little sort of a Excel process sheet where people can rate the business from one to 10, according to things like, you know, do you need finance for it? You know, uh, you know, are you happy with the business? Is the the business model that you want? All these different little things that can allow it to be scored from a zero to a 10. And then if it gets higher than like a seven, then they can, proceed in doing a deeper dive into due diligence. So it's not a, a piece of software, but there's a few tools that I have sort of built out that people can use. Very cool. And and so how does somebody uh, mm-hmm. uh, join your community and uh, take your courses and maybe even uh, get to work with you one-on-one? Yeah, sure. The first thing is people like to see is you know, check out my podcast um, so they can really like listen to me a bit more of like, oh, is this Jared guy trustworthy or not? 
um, you know, listen to me and 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 see if I'm the person that can actually help you. Uh, and then, you know, just go to my website, um, buyingonlinebusiness.com and forward slash community. And then you can you can check out what is in the community and how it all works. And um, I speak to I speak to all my guys when they when do due diligence for reviews and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, we have a good time. Cool. It's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jared. This was great. And uh, wow, you are, you have some really deep knowledge in this area of uh, uh, buying and selling of online businesses. And I'm I'm sure that uh, our, our listeners have gotten some great tips from this. So thank you so much. And uh, listeners, now take this knowledge and apply it. Grow your business uh, to the point where you, it's worthy of being sold or buy a business uh, or uh, you know, work with brokers to, uh, uh, to do both even. So we'll catch you on the next episode of Marketing Speak. This is your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off.